uh, we have a a non guest guest speaker this morning. Uh, Ricky Ramos is my father in law. He is a friend to many of you. He is a man of stature and character in this church. He leads a small group, and before he came on this church plant, he served for over twenty years as a pastor in El Paso, Texas, in Juarez, Mexico. Uh, he is a gifted and godly man in providing wise counsel, and we would commend him to you uh, in the ordinary life of this church. But I also wanted him to be able to speak to you from a somewhat unique passage this morning. And I thought his experience and his stature in this church would, would be a blessing particular as he brings this passage. I am looking forward to hearing this passage from him. Uh, you'll see what I mean as he begins to look into this message. So if you could welcome him as he comes to speak to us. Well, good morning. It is uh, my privilege you know, to stand here before you and uh, be able to preach. I um, I don't get to do this uh, much anymore, so I feel a little rusty. Um, and particularly when John, you know, comes, on, comes out and assigns me, you know, this passage. Um, and um, I was hearing the, the encouragement that we received, even at this point, from the church, from the worship, from the word that came to us, um, um, Bart's prayer, um, or, or Bart's... Um, uh, introduction when we started the service there has been a lot of encouragement so and then we and then we see this slide of uh, Camp Kili Manjaro and I, I mean I'm thinking how am I going to transition from all that encouragement you know and that you know feel good stuff to a passage like this uh, which is uh, in Acts uh, 5 verse 1 to 11 that it deals with um, a, a, a couple but the, the main character here uh, is not the couple, it is God. And, and we want to see God and what he wants to communicate to us in this passage. So I feel very inadequate to do this, but let's give it a try. And let's pray. Jesus, we, we thank you so far for um, your presence here. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence. And we uh, know that you are with us and that you are leading us, that you are meeting with us, that you are encouraging us, and also you're going to speak to us, each one of us individually as we uh, preach and ex exposit your word, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go to Acts chapter 5. It says, But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself and his with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard him. The young man got up and covered him. The young man got up and covered him, and after carrying him out, he, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the, the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out, out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young man came in and found her dead and then carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And a great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. This is not, as we see it up front, a happy passage. 
it's a, a, a passage about judgment. And um, Luke could have gone, you know, in his narrative, in his account of the things that were going on, he could have gone from chapter 437, where Barnabas sold a field and brought the money at the apostle fields, at, at the apostles' feet, to Acts 5.12, where many signs and wonders were being done among the people by the, by the hand of the apostles. But he needs to include this incident that really happened. If he was going to be faithful to the account of what was going on, he was going to be a good journalist, if I may say, a good reporter. He had to report this. It really happened, and he had to be faithful and write it in for the benefit of his readers, because there is a point uh, to be made here in what's going on in the church at this time in its history. Um, this week I was uh, watching a little bit of TV, and I kind of gravitate to older um, pr programs from when I was younger, and um, came across this, uh, um, this show that um, a lot of uh, you might be familiar, Highway to Heaven. And um, it's about an angel and his friend, and um, the episode just goes along. There's a situation, and they intervene, and they get it solved. You know, they reconcile the, the parties that were at, in conflict. But at the end, two um, young men re remain obnoxious, you know, towards those that have been reconciled and the, and, and the work that has been done. So they're riding along, you know, in their bikes, these two obnoxious guys. And uh, they were, they're calling out names to their neighbor. And Jonathan, the angel, pauses. And then he causes them to run into each other's bikes, falling down to the ground. And he kind of smirks and smiles about that, you know. And, and uh, he says, you know, I probably shouldn't have done that. And uh, Mark, his buddy, replies, uh, I don't think he is going to mind at all. You know, this mentality that God will not mind about something, this is obviously not a serious thing. I mean, it's a show. But it, it caught my attention in, this, in, the, in bringing to, to the forefront the fact that God does mind things. He is observing what's going on in the world. And in particular, he's, going, he's observing what's going on in the church. And he's observing what is going on in our hearts. So this is an entirely different situation, but here the author wants us to understand that God minds what goes on in his church. In this passage, we come across the, the holiness of God. It, it is the Holy Spirit here that is the center, at the center of this passage. We come across the holiness of God and God's zeal for the holiness and the purity of his church, particularly in this stage in his history. Uh, it is the first time in the book of Acts that the uh, term church, ecclesia, which is church gathering, the assembly of his people, is used um, to, to refer to the community of believers in Jesus. So it is a significant thing that it, the church is identified in such a way. In this particular incident, when Jesus, where God is present, you know, to execute judgment because something is happening in the church. So this is happening not just with God or the church, but God in the church. So this event happens in the, in the church, in the presence of God. So when Ananias came to Peter and to those assembled to lay them the money at, the, at, the, at their feet, he was in holy ground. He, was, he didn't come into a club. He didn't come into any, just, any, any gathering and bring a, an offering to anybody, you know, just anybody. He was coming into this place, this new temple, where God has, had decided to come and dwell, which is his church. And he wants, to, he wants his church to be particularly holy and unblemished. So it happens um, in that place. So this is a difficult passage because in the Bible, you know, it, 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 here it deals with swift judgment. And this swiftness kind of rubs against our understanding about 
how God is loving and gracious. And that's what we were hearing this morning, how God is good and patient and faithful. And he's enduring. And uh, uh, even uh, Bart's expression that our sins are covered, you know, under an ocean of grace. I mean, those things are very true. I mean, they, they are things that we should, you know, treasure and let them uh, soak into our soul. And we should hear them and appreciate them. And so, yes, God is love. And his love is a persevering love. It does not end. It doesn't have a, a, a limit. The gospel is about all that. It's about, you know, our sins being buried in that ocean of grace. It is about receiving God's gracious love. But we would be amiss to receive his love and forget this other aspect of God, which is his holiness and his desire for his church to be holy. We would be amiss to forget whose love is it that we're receiving? Whose grace is it that we are enjoying? Holiness is that attribute of God that is intensified by a threefold repetition in Isaiah 6 to holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at that particular time, his presence was filling the church in that moment. It implies absolute moral purity. That is who God is. He is absolutely perfect, morally pure. That means that he's separate from evil and from sin. He's separate even from his creation. He is above and transcends his creation. He is other than we are. And I think in some ways, indirectly, this passage wants to highlight less uh, so that the church as he goes on in, in its triumphant you know, uh, journey does not forget who God is and who is it that has given them this grace. He is not just this Santa Claus up there that kind of this glorified human, like Mark said, you know, in this, in this uh, sitcom, that he's, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. He won't mind. You know, I understand. He's like, kind of, he kind of thinks like me. You know, he'll pass it. You know, he will not mind sin. But in this case, the sin that is going to happen is a serious sin. And God, in his prerogative, you know, executes a judgment for the benefit of his own holiness and for the benefit of, of the church. In his holiness, God is unique and there is no one like him. Yet the Bible teaches us that holiness is a communicable attribute of God that he wants his people to imitate. In that respect, holy means separate, devoted to God's servant. Holiness provides for us and for the church the pattern for his people to imitate, to follow. He commands them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. And there they are to know that God's discipline even is given to us that we may share in that holiness. So God wants us to receive fully his love, his forgiveness, his care, all that. But he also wants us to be awed by who he is. The fact that he, being a holy God, can relate to us and give us his grace should bring this um, mixture together of, of grace and holiness and, us, and, and awe that we might have a clear picture of who God is and be the people that he wants us to be. This passage shows that the early church was not perfect, as we in this church are not perfect. It brings to the forefront the reality of the indwelling presence of sin and that not even the early church was exempt from it. It underscores the presence and seriousness of that sin then the need to be on our guard against it. We need to be on our guard against it. Again, it shows that God is committed to the holiness to the, and to the purity of his church. So the, the context where this is happening is that the church has, was being powerful, was a, being a powerful witness, proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel. It was, it was characterized particularly by the fullness of the Spirit. There was spiritual vitality. There was spiritual momentum. It says that all believers were 
filled with the Holy Spirit, and they had experienced a change of heart. They had a change of perspective on how they looked at things, a new paradigm that led them to view their own possessions even with new eyes, not seeing them as their own and willing to act sacrificially for the benefit of others as genuine need arose. So that is what is happened. It is what the Holy Spirit is producing. And I guess God is observing that and he wants to preserve that. He doesn't want it to be corrupted. But the emphasis of the passage we must keep in mind is that of the, re of the reality of the Holy Spirit spirit indwelling presence in the church. So that, I, I think I am anticipating a little my, myself, but that, that is where the sin is so grievous. The, the sin of these two, of these two, of this man and, the, and this woman, this couple, was because they were actually sinning in a delivered way, you know, in the very presence of God, in the holy presence of God. They did not take into account seriously who they were dealing with. So, the reality of the Holy Spirit is, is, is what we need to keep in mind, together with the solemn implications of that fact. That the Holy Spirit is present in the church has implications. It means that we, ha we, are, we have to do with a holy God. So, not only illustrates... Luke's honest realism, throwing light into the interior life. Uh, this is um, a commentary from um, um, uh, Mr. John Stott. Um, so it not only illustrates the honest realism, throwing light into the interior life of the first spirit-filled community, that, it, that is not all romance and righteousness in the church, but is intended to serve as a warning to others, and, and, and indeed it is to serve. As we read a passage like this and come across it in the scripture, it is intended to be a warning to us about, you know, God's holiness and his zeal for holiness in the church. So Ananias, it says the, 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 the plot, blatant dishonesty and willful deceit. A man, Ananias, with his wife, sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself and his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. We do not know much about Ananias and so far. The, the text doesn't say too much. An Hananiah, which is the Hebrew for Han Ananias, means actually the Lord is gracious and Sapphira means beautiful. And they were in all likelihood Jews. And they could have been added to the number of those of the church earlier, and now we're a, a part of the community of believers. We don't know for sure if they were or not um, believers, genuine believers. Um, uh, other men uh, in commentary say that there's actually no way to um, make sure, know for sure if they were or they were not. But I, I think we can assume that they would have been familiar, at least as Jews, with the Old Testament teaching about God's holiness and his call for his people to be holy. They must have been familiar with the, the stories about Nadab, Nadab and Abihu, you know, the sons of Aaron, who uh, offered you know, a strange fire, something that was not prescribed in this, uh, by God, and they offered something to God that was not uh, permitted, and God judged them. Uh, also with the story of uh, uh, Uzziah, who, you know, dared, you know, to, to reach out to hold uh, the Ark of the Covenant and not fall, and he was immediately there judged. Um, those actions affronted, affronted, the Bible tells us, affronted the holiness of God. They might seem unjust to us, but they affronted God's holiness. They went against what God had instructed and what God had desired for his people. And if those things had not been addressed, they would have had a corrupting effect in the people of God. So, in this text, it appears that the idea of what they were going to do or might have originated with Ananias. For it says that, and he and kept back some of the price for himself. So it seems like he is the one that is reaching, and he's the one that is keeping the money. But he was doing it with the full knowledge um, 
Mr. John Stott says, you know, the connivance uses these words, it means collusion, the participation of Sapphira. Together they conspired to sell a property that they owned at a certain price and to keep a part of that money and then bring the rest of the money to the apostles and present it as if it was the total price of the sale of their property. The, as if is what is important here. They were coming into the presence of God in the church and presenting this gift to the apostles, to God, as if that had been the whole price that they had received. They kept, kept back. That word means to misappropriate. It means that they had probably had made an agreement or entered uh, some sort of contract or agreement with the church that they would probably give, you know, the price of that property to the church. So it implies that in keeping part of that money, they were in, in, in a very well embezzling money from God, and they were lying about it. So you can see, you know, the seriousness of this. This is a, a deliberate, you know, action uh, on their part. Mr. Daryl Block uh, says that Ananias' action represents a priority to obey man or seek human praise rather than honor God. The deceitful act was completely premeditated, apparently motivated by the desire of Ananias and Sapphira to appear more generous than they truly are. Their desire for human praise is more important to them than being faithful to God. So we can, as we see this, as we hear this, and we see them approaching to lay this offering at the apostles' feet, we, we know that God is seeing this inner motivation. And he's saying, this is not a good seed to be planted in this church. And, and he sees that they are determined. They have thought about it, and they have determined to go ahead with it. But Peter said he, that was the plot. And then the, the unmasking is that Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? And I think very important here is this word filled. How has it happened that Satan has filled your heart instead of being filled with the Holy Spirit. They were in the midst of the church. The Holy Spirit was moving. The Holy Spirit was doing mighty works among them. It was evident to them. They actually wanted to, they were seeing, probably were seeing that, oh, so we want to participate, but they were not doing it with God. They were doing it with themselves, and they opened their, selves, opened their hearts up to be influenced more by the lie of the devil than to be influenced by the Holy Spirit and producing the fruit that it was producing in everybody else. What could have caused you to open your heart to the Father of lies and be influenced and led by Him instead of the, the Spirit of truth, allowing your heart to be filled to lie to none other than God? That is what Peter is unmasking here before Ananias. He's standing there and Peter is just laying it open and saying, why are you doing this? You have not lied to um, man, but you have lied to God. So he lies to the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. This is, that's why Ananias' sin is so grievous against God and against his church. This feeling, this allowing himself to be filled is opposite of the earlier feelings of being filled with the Spirit of God. Satan is using Ananias and Sapphira to try to undermine what the community represents, what God is doing. Satan, scheming to find ways to destroy the church, is the one who tries to sow a corrupting seed in God's community of believers. 
Being the father of lies, he tempts and plants in Ananias and Sapphira's heart to willfully, willfully lie. And they allowed this evil to gain root in their hearts. And they found themselves lying to God, setting themselves as opponents to God, to what God was doing. So, Mr. David Peterson, David Peterson says, this narrative particularly warns against, again, this is a warning passage, warns against anything that hinders the expression of unity, love, and holiness in the fellowship created by the Spirit. Peter, in his, le in his letter, later, in his first letter, later, says the following, Be sober. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith. So the primary characteristic of the church in Acts was not their generosity, but that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The love and generous acts of kindness among them was the fruit, the result of what the Spirit of God was doing in them. So Peter unmasks the plot, and then he delivers the verdict. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And the irony here is that all this is completely unnecessary. They did not have to go through, go through these antics, but they did it because they, they were motivated wrongly in their heart. And they didn't have to do it. Nobody was being compelled at any time by anybody at that time or even today by God or to sell their property and to give it to the church. It was the fruit of the work of the Spirit, of, a, of changed hearts that were thankful for God and they, that generosity and that care and concern for others was being born in their hearts by the Spirit for the church. So it was completely unnecessary. It was all voluntary. If he sold anything, the process was still his to decide what to give or not what to give. He had total control in deciding what to do. So that goes with even what Paul teaches in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, which says, each man must do as he has purposed. That means that he has liberty to purpose something in his heart, and then do according to what he has purposed in his heart before God. So he says, Lord, I'm going to give $10. Give the $10. That's what you have purpose in your heart. Don't say, I'm going to give you $10, and then try to say, I'm going to give you just eight, and that's the whole 10. You are at freedom to purpose in your heart what you want to give. Nobody is compelling you to give. The Holy Spirit is motivating, is moving you to give because of His grace, because of His love, because of His generous blessing towards us and towards you and I. So we have that liberty. So each man must give as he purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, not under compulsion. It says, for God loves a cheerful, a cheerful giver. So after Satan filled their, his heart and fan, fanned his own lust of Ananias, Ananias conceived in his heart. He conceived in his heart this deed. And then he let it take root, and then he let, he let it uh, go all its way and went on ahead with it and found himself guilty of lying to God himself. Therefore, the responsibility for the act, though influenced by Satan, is Ananias directly. And that is something that we need to learn. You know, Satan is always trying to influence us so that we might sin against God. He influences us, but the fault, the fault is not his. The fault is us that give in to his temptation and follow his lead. 
It is out of his own heart that Ananias has acted. And it is his heart, apart from God, that Ananias has obeyed. So Proverbs 4.23 tells us also that we are to watch over our hearts with all diligence. That is something that we need to always be doing. This is not a just one-time thing. There is a constant activity of the Christian. Even in the midst of the church, even in the midst of when we are, everything's going good, we are still to be guarded in our hearts. For from it, it says, flows the springs of life. And it goes on to say in verse 24, put away, particularly, put away from you a deceitful mouth. When a deceitful mouth speaks from a deceitful heart that has been influenced by not, but not by God, but by some other influence. So put away from, your, from you a deceitful mouth and, and put devious speech far from you. So Peter delivers the verdict and with this, it comes a warning to us as well. And the judgment follows. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard it. The young man got up and covered him up. And after carrying him out, they buried him. So as Peter spoke, Ananias as he's standing before Peter and the others that were there, Ananias realized that his plot has been exposed by none other than God himself. And he heard the, 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 the verdict of guilty. And I can imagine, even being in a court of law, if you are there because you committed a crime, and then the jury comes. And I, I can, I, I haven't, it hasn't been my experience, but I can Imagine the sinking feeling when the jury comes out and finds you guilty. And they, the judge says, you are, are guilty. And I think that, that kind of dawns on you at that point. Oh, man, I am guilty. And that alone probably could kill somebody. And some people suggest that that stress probably could have killed um, Ananias. Or some even suggest that Peter's gaze intense gaze and words against Ananias would have killed him, you know, a shock in his heart or something like that. But the Bible clearly makes um, uh, the, the case that it is God that is judging Ananias. It is not uh, something physical. He may use something physical, uh, his heart, but God is the one that is executing this judgment as the righteous judge that wants to keep his church holy and pure. It continues, Now there elapsed an interval, about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. That, that, that. Peter, at this point, you know, he saw God's judgment of Ananias immediately. I mean, he said the verdict, and immediately, you know, uh, Ananias fell down and stopped breathing. And now uh, Sapphira comes in, and at least he's asking her. He's saying, did you sell this land for such and such a price? Are you going to reconsider and come out with the truth? Or are you going to be determined and continue in your life. So there's an opportunity to repent. And she said, no, that's not the price. You know, we, we sold it for such and such, but you know, we, you know, me and uh, Ananias, sorry, you know, we, we you know, we, uh, we thought that we could do this, but I'm, I'm, I want to come clean. No, that's not what happened. She, like, they, cons they uh, how do you say, um, they plotted together, and they set their hearts to carry this through. And so she will not, you know, uh, give uh, away what they were doing. So she said, yes, 
Yes, with assurance, she said, that was the price. At that moment, she is also lying. She's hardening her heart and continuing to say, yes, that is what it is. There, there is no sense of her reconsidering. There is no sense of her you know, showing uh, repentance, showing grief for what they were doing. So it shows the determination of her heart, unrepentant heart. And then Peter said to her, Again, why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord? That he, he is the person that is being affected. He is the one that is judging all these things. You are testing not me, not the church, the people here. You are actually have determined to test the Spirit of the Lord who is present in His church. And your actions have the potential of corrupting, corrupting His church. And He is going to judge you right now. And he did. Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately, says, she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young man came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Going back to Mark from the heaven, highway to heaven, does God mind, you know, when we are hard and determined and unrepentant, sinning, you know, in a way that affronts his holiness and can damage what he's trying to build in his church? Will he just say, ah, no, no, he will not mind. If we are thinking that way, it means that we have been affected by sitcoms. You know, we have been affected by what other people think about God. But God has revealed himself as holy. And his purpose is holy for the church. His purpose is holy to, for us. And this is actually not an easy um, message to preach because I am aware that I am not holy. He says that great fear came upon the church. Because they realize who, they got a, 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 again a glimpse as to who they're dealing with. Who is it that is present? Who is it that has saved them? Who is it that has given them grace? Who is it that has cleansed them from the, their sin and given them hope for eternal life? And they realize it is Elohim. It is Yahweh. It is the Holy One, the Almighty, the Transcendent One, the Other. And He is here in our midst. And so, so how can you, you know, so great fear comes. And I am fearful, saying, Lord, I, give me grace to preach this. Because I, how can I preach aware that I myself find myself sinning so many times in so many ways? I pray that I have a heart, not a sapphira that did not want to repent, but that, that quickly repents. Because there is forgiveness. If we confess our sins, you know, he is quick. And he chooses just to, re, to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But when we harden our hearts, we might come to that place of sinning against maybe what the Bible says, sinning against the Holy Spirit. When, when we come, become such, with such hardened hearts that there's no repentance in our hearts. And God has, there's no more he can do. And we're sinning against the Holy Spirit. And he says that is the unforgivable sin. So we need to... We, we need to allow that fear, that holy fear, that proper fear, to balance grace. Because grace is wonderful. It is an ocean. Thank you for that. That's going to stay with me. An ocean of grace. But His holiness is also an ocean. It's a universe of purity and moral uprightness. And there is separateness from evil and sin in God. And he will not tolerate it. The cross itself is evidence that God will not tolerate sin. And he will not tolerate grievous sin that affects the, the, the building of, and the purpose of his church. So why such an immediate judgment then? In their blindness, Ananias and Sapphira may have thought 
maybe like Mark, that guy that was with Jonathan, that God would not see what they were doing. He kind of was like, you know, this was going to be just um, a horizontal transaction. I'm going to, me and Sapphira are going to present ourselves before these people horizontally, and we're going to, how do you say, um, pop, prop ourselves up before them. God will not see, and if he did, he would not care. That was a mistake, a serious mistake on their part. Their concern was with themselves, not with the glory of God. And I think God, one, all of us who have seen by, the, by God's grace and the, by the illumination of the Holy Spirit, we have seen the Lord, and we have seen His holiness, and we have seen what He has done in the cross to save us, to take away our sin, should have, and I think we do have a heart to glorify God with what we do, with our decisions, with our actions, with what we consider, what we purpose in our heart. That's why I guess the Bible says, let your say be no, or let your say be yes, and keep your vows to the Lord if you make them. You know, be clear. If you're going to sell the, pro the property for this price, bring that price if you're going to give that price. But don't try to, to deceive God. That is so, you know, well, but we can do it. We all have the potential, and I think that's why fear came in the hearts of people, because everybody realized, oh, I could be doing that. My heart can lean that way. It's not just, um, you know, let's, let's be careful not to judge Ananias and Sapphira. We all have, we are all potential Ananiases and Sapphiras. So that, that is why God, in his mercy, permits this. And this is included in this section of Scripture to warn us and to harness our, our, our mind and, and, our, and, and, our whole, and our soul and our heart so that we will not be led astray. We are to glorify God and we are to seek the well-being of the church. In their hypocrisy, they wanted to credit and prestige of, sacrifice, of sacrificial generosity without, without the inconvenience of it. So in order to gain a reputation to which they had no right, they told a brazen lie to God, and God executed his judgment immediately to remove this attempt to undermine the church. And this is a quote from the, uh, the English uh, ESV, English Standard Version. Uh, in the Study Bible, it says the, the following. One can view this, the event of God's removal, uh, this removal from the young Christian community of the distrust and disunity provoked by the couple's dishonesty at a time when the Holy Spirit was especially present in the community, blessing it with the unity of fellowship and the power of miracles. And it says, that same power brought judgment to those who, by their actions, denied that unity and power. So that was serious, and I would think that that is why the judgment was immediate. This was a premeditated, blatant, and defiant sin against God and His church, and it warns us the story warns us against anything that hinders the expression of unity, love, and holiness, again, in the fellowship created by the Spirit. Mr. Peterson says, was God, was God, well, he doesn't, uh, this is my question, was God going to mind? Yes, this is what Mr. Peterson says. This is a unique, and some call it a miracle judgment. This is a unique judgment at a sensitive point in the church church's early days, the omniscience of God, the fact that God sees all, and he does see all, and the accountability of God are the key points that Luke is making in this passage. So let me um, just close with th three brief points of application. First one is always remember 
from whom you have received grace. He is a consuming fire. God is love, but he is also holy. And he tells us that his holiness be reflected in his church. Be thankful for the cross from which grace flows to sinners like you and me. Psalm 31 one says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. But let's also be warned. And let's read from Hebrews 10.26 for this warning. Hebrews 10.26 to 31. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and who has treated as unholy the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Secondly, be filled with the spirit. I am... Um, I was talking to Zach yesterday. We had a, a little meeting, and uh, the, the, we were reviewing the chapter of the book of Knowing God, dealing with the Trinity and the Holy Spirit particularly. And we were just talking about the, the reality that for us to acknowledge and to become aware and engage with the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. He says, Packer says, that without the Holy Spirit, there won't be any faith. There would be no believers. There will, not, there will not be any church. There would be nothing. Because without regeneration, which the Holy Spirit affects in people, the new birth, we could not believe. Our eyes would be still blinded, and there would be no faith. There would be no believers. There would be no church. The Holy Spirit is the agent that God is using to reveal himself at this time. And we are amiss if we don't honor the Holy Spirit as we do Jesus and as we do the Father and as we do God as one in three persons. So be filled. The, the Bible in different occasions, in, um, in, in, in Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled with the Spirit. In Galatians 5.16 says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of of the flesh. You will not be led astray. You will be able, with the Spirit of God, to resist. If, you're, if your heart is full with the Spirit of God, then how can God, Satan, fill that heart? But if your heart is empty, and it's just filled with yourself and your lusts and desires, then it's easy. You are, we are easy prey, and we will not be able to resist the devil, and he will come, and he can, with more ease, be able to influence us. So, be filled with the Spirit. The early church was filled with the Spirit. The Spirit came upon the church. The Spirit was moving in the midst of the church and in the church, doing things, wonderful things, as the church advanced. So we as individuals and as a church should be welcoming always the presence of the Holy Spirit, inviting Him to be with us all the time. All the time. Walking the first lesson that we got with John last week was walking with God. How do we walk with God in this present age? We walk with Him with the Spirit. The Spirit is the one that has been given to us. Be filled with the Spirit. We should be praying, Lord, fill me again. And Lord, fill me again. I need to be filled always with you. And that will keep us safe. That will keep us strong. That will, will be able again to resist the temptation the, of the devil that tries to come and stir and fan our lusts, our cravings, and twist our motivations and convert us into hypocrites 
And we are all, we are all prone to that. We are all subject to that. So we need to be guarding our hearts. And thirdly, learn the fear of the Lord. The result of all this that happened was that great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard these things. And we are hearing these things. <laughs> we didn't see them, but we are also hearing them. It is mentioned two times that great fear came over all the church. Does it mean that they became afraid of God? Or does it mean that a greater aware awareness of his majesty, holiness, and awesomeness came to the forefront before their eyes? I think it's the second. The presence of God does not produce fear of uh, uh, being afraid. It produces fear be being in the presence of something that is bigger and other than us. It doesn't produce being afraid as it produces that awareness of who God is. And it produces awareness of his seal for the holiness and the purity of his church. So we need to continue, as we have probably have been doing in our, our Christian life, to cultivate, cultivate a heart and an attitude of reverent fear for his transcendent holiness, keeping in mind that he wants his people, us, his ecclesia, his church, to be holy, just as he is holy. Psalm 34, 11. Come, says my children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 24, 14, 27 says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we honor you this morning. We uh, recognize your presence in us. We would not be here. We would not gather. We would not have these thoughts of you in our minds and these feelings in our hearts toward you if it wasn't for your work. Initially, when you caused us, Lord, to be born again and enabled us, Lord, giving us the gift of faith, so that we might believe in who Jesus is, the Son of God who came, Lord, to take away our sins and bury them under that ocean of grace. Lord, we, we thank you for that. We acknowledge your presence. And we want to be aware of whom it is that we have received grace from. We want to be constantly aware who is it that has given us grace. Grace is valuable, valuable because of who it is that is giving it to us. Favor from God for those who deserved his wrath. Lord, help us to be aware. Help us, Lord, fill us with your presence even now afresh. Fill our minds, cleanse us, renew us with your presence, Lord, that it would give us spiritual momentum forward with you and that we might seek you in a more diligent, intentional way. Cause us, Lord, to learn the fear of the Lord. Lord, that we might find its fountain of life and be turned away from the snares of death. In Jesus' name, amen.